All right, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Venkat, for that nice introduction. Uh, my name is Pratik Patel. I am going to be talking about Vue.js today. And uh, just to, since we're a little bit early, I will just give a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm a Java champion, but I also do lots of stuff with JavaScript, Python, uh, and many other languages. And our rough outline for today's session is what you see on the screen. And of course, I'll make the code uh, available. Uh, we're not going to really use uh, the slide deck much today since this is an abbreviated 30 minute session. But what I do want to start off with is why do we want to consider using Vue.js in our application? All right. So this is a great question because as we've seen even just today with the number of different web frameworks discussed, specifically Angular and React, there is plenty of choice out there for what to build your front end in. Right? We're not really going to talk about the back end that much. We're going to focus on the front end today. But why Vue.js? And I'll tell you why I think Vue.js is a wonderful framework for building front end applications. For me, the first thing is that Vue has a low learning curve. And I think this is super important in today's world that you are able to get started and be productive as a developer very quickly. Okay. Now, Vue is also known as a progressive framework. So what that means is that we start simple and then we add in features as we need them. So we don't have to go and learn a whole bunch of things all at once. We can just learn a few simple things to get started with with Vue.js, and then we can add in features as we need them. If you need to have state management, you can add in Vue.x. If you need client-side routing, you can go add in Vue Router. If you want to build a larger application that has lots of bells and whistles built in with lots of features out of the box, you can then use a platform like Nux.js, which is a nice framework for building Vue.js applications. The other thing about Vue.js that I find really nice is that developing in Vue is intuitive and conventions are natural. It's not much of an effort to learn some of the things that you need to know in Vue.js because they just kind of come naturally to you or they're just intuitive, which I think is great. And one interesting thing about Vue is that it's not backed by a company. It's 100% community driven. So for example, Angular is backed by Google, of course. React is backed by Facebook. But Vue is 100% community driven and they support themselves through donations and other things, but they're very focused on what users actually want. People like you and me, developers who are building real world applications can be part of the process for enhancing the framework and adding new features, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so with that front matter, out of the way in terms of why are we interested in Vue.js, let's look at a super simple Vue application, right? So what we'll do is we will go in and look at just a blank web page to start off with. Let's make this a little bit bigger and let's get our web browser up next to it, okay? So you can see this is a simple web page. And the key part here is I have a script tag that points to the Vue.js library. Now, for the first few examples, we will just literally use a web page that imports the view library. There's no Webpack, there's no NPM, there's no other tooling or plumbing around it. it. This is what I mean by you can start very, very simply and then build up and add features as you need them. Uh, okay, so it looks like someone is having trouble seeing my computer screen. Oh, thank you. Okay. Can you do a share screen, right. please? There you yes. go. And we should bring there we go. you All in. Right. All right. Sorry about that. I thought it was already being shared. OK. Don't worry. You didn't miss much. Uh, <laughs> I was just showing some slides uh, that I talked over anyway. So let, let's talk about uh, building a basic view application. Again, what I have here is a very simple HTML page. And then we have this script tag, which imports the view library into it. Right, and if we see here, we just have a simple H1 with a hello in it. And again, this doesn't have any Webpack or any tooling or live updating. You can do all those things with Vue.js, but we're not gonna do them 
just yet. We're going to keep it as simple as possible and build something out. Okay. So you can say hello from Atlanta where I live. And I'm going to save that reload. And of course, we're not doing any real view yet, but we will in just a second. All right. So now that we've imported the view library up here, we go and initialize our view instance. We say new view and we say mount our view application into the app div, which is right here. Okay. And then I'm, I have a data portion here, which we're going to use in just a second. Now, our first bullet point was how do we work with data? So I have this data block declared inside of my view instance, and then I have this greeting object here. How do I show this greeting, which says, hello, all the talks? Let's get rid of this for now. Okay, so get rid of this, we'll reload it, you'll see nothing shows up. What I can do is I can use semantic syntax like this and simply grab that greeting variable that I declared in the data portion of this, put it in like so, reload, and you'll see that it says, hello, all the talks but it has the uh, I tag, which is italics, of course, in HTML shown there. What's going on there? Well, when we use this semantic way to show this, it literally shows exactly what we have in the variable. That's not exactly what we want here. So let's get rid of this and let's use the declarative way to use this data. So what we'll do here is we'll say V dash text, right? So this is a uh, the declarative way to get to this. And uh, it's also sometimes referred to as um, the, uh, basically the, the tag wave. We'll, we'll get to the tags in just a second. So let's say greeting, save, and reload. And we're still seeing the same thing. So we still saw the same thing. Let's uh, change this to make sure that this worked, right? So you'll see that hello, all the talks 2020 showed up, which is what I just changed right here. Now, what if we want to show this as HTML and not as straight text? We can use v-html. Now we'll reload this, and now you'll see this shows as we expected. Hello, all the talks 2020 in italics, right? So we used a directive here to go and grab this data and show that. So pretty straightforward. So working with HTML fragments using declarative and semantic syntax. So again, this is declarative when we use v-html inside of a, a, almost like an attribute. We could also do this, which would, of course, not do the HTML, uh, but just show the straight text. Now, the difference between, let's, uh, let's copy this line right here. And let's say we did v-text. And let's just show them next to each other real quick. OK, let's reload this. Now, the difference between these two is the v-text takes literally the text that we have in the data or the string and shows it in the HTML. What v-html does is that it goes and actually mounts it as inner HTML. So we have to be a little bit careful when we do v-html because we're literally mounting that, whatever that data is, in this case, this fragment right here, in as inner HTML. So we just need to be a little bit careful that uh, we do use that in the right way, okay? So we have, uh, shown the declarative and semantic way, use HTML fragments. And now let's do something else, actually. Let's do a little bit, uh, something a little bit different. Let's say, um, how about, let's show the time. So we'll say time, new date. Now we're using a JavaScript object, date, of course. And then I'll come into here in the second v dash text and say, instead of greeting, let's show the time. Let's save it and reload it. And here we go. Here's our time. Okay. Now, what if we only want to show the time if it's after 12 o'clock? How would we do something like that? So let's go back into our data block here and we'll say time of day colon function and let's return 12 for noon, for example. Okay. Now let's create a, another block here and let's say, we'll let's just call this a div for now. We'll say v dash if. Okay, equals, and let's put an expression inside of this. We'll say if this is our variable, or this is what we're going to use here that time, right? And I need to have this in the right place. It needs to be inside the div tag, not outside, because that is what's going to get toggled. Let's reformat this a little bit, All right? So we'll say if time of day is greater than 10, then show the time. Okay, so let's save that. Let's reload it, and you can see it doesn't show anymore. But if we say at the time of day, which again, time of day is down here, function return 12. We just hard-coded this 
for the time being. Let's make that 13, save it, and reload it. And it still doesn't work. What have we done wrong here? Okay, let's actually say, I did test this out earlier, but obviously I don't know how to do this properly. Time of day. B dash if time of day greater than 12. Yep, that should be good. What have we done wrong here? Let's come into here. Let's put a larger number in here. And of course, none of this is going to work because I'm doing a live demo. Okay. So if we look at this, let's examine this for just a second. We said that we have this time of day function. It returns the value 12. We could have just used a number, I guess, here. Uh, and then we say, uh, Maybe it's because we don't have this in the actual tag. So let's change that to an H1 and let's reload that. And none of this is working. So we'll come back to V-F in a bit, right? I'll have to think about what we have done wrong here. Right, that should be working. Dash if equals 12. Okay. Anyways, we will come back to this in just a minute and we'll see what we can do um what we uh what we can do with this let's get rid of this for now okay we've talked about uh the conditional in just a second i'll figure out what's wrong with that um but let's talk about properties and what we can do with them and other things around this first let's have a look at a v-4 so let's say h1 v-4 Right, we'll create the data for this equals URL in U in U U R Ls, and then we'll just show the URL here. We'll create a list of URLs here in just a second. Okay, so there's our URL, comma URLs colon, and then let's create a simple list, and we'll say URL one. Right. We'll fill this in with URLs later if we have time, URL2. Let's save that and let's reload this. And you can see we have a v-4 here. Um, and what this does is this is base, a basic iterator around how we build this part out here, right? This is basically how we do uh, looping. So we say URLs, URL123. If I add a few more in here, you'll see that they will also pop up, right? I'm gonna just be lazy and copy those again. We're looking at how we do a for loop in this. So let's reload that. We got URL one, two, three, a bunch of times, or URLs several times here. Okay, so we'll save that. And you'll see that we're iterating over those different things. All right, so let's just do a quick check and see what we've done here. We've done this, looked at data a little bit. Um, we have also talked about HTML fragments and my mouse is not working properly. Uh, we tried unsuccessfully to do V conditionals, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, now let's look at how we bind this into data properties and how we use some more tag attributes. Okay, so let's go and create a input field. So what we'll say here is uh, let's just create a simple input and say input and the input type will be text, okay? And we will use another directive called v-model equals talk title in here. Okay, there's our input. And let's go and see if this shows up first before we add the data. Okay, so now we have our input here. All right. Now let's go and create data that maps that input. So we said this is talk title. And again, what we're doing is we're building out a form, talk title, and we'll just give it some placeholder here, some title. Okay, save, reload, and it helps if you surround. Okay, 
and format your HTML properly. Okay, so here's some title now. Okay, so you can see that it says some title. And uh, this is no fun. Let's go and actually show that talk title next to it. Uh, let's insert a break here, BR. Okay, let's reload that. And there's some, some title again. Let's add a little bit more space. All right, now you'll see as I come into this input field and I type something that we immediately see it echoed back when we use this directive to show it. And I'm using a semantic directive here, but uh, it doesn't have to be like that. We could also do an H1 and say V dash text equals talk title, and it will show it also, same thing, right? So there's some title, and I'm going to type something now, and it goes and shows that like so, okay? So, um, what we're looking at here is what we call two-way data binding using V dash model. So bindings are two-way in React, and we have just used the V dash model, which gives us that two-way data binding. Okay. The other thing that you may have noticed is that the data process we've been using so far have just been primitives, and so things like numbers, strings, etc., can be used. You can also use arrays, but arrays of primitives can be used as data properties. Okay, we also covered v dash loops earlier. So we've done that. We're making some good headway here. And let's go look at some more directives. Just a second. Okay, so let's go and refactor this application. And we have this right here. And let's go and add a little bit of extra stuff around it and say h1 is talk title. Okay, so We've said uh, v dash, uh, we added talk title here, and that's some title, which is this thing right here. All right, oops, hit the wrong button here. Okay, so let's see if we can use some more directives here. Um, what if there's a bit of data that we only want to render once? Okay, let's save that, let's reload it, and let's go change this now. And you'll see that this expression right here, or let's actually simplify this. Let's use the same thing, both with v dash once and without v dash once, so that you can see exactly what's going on. Okay, so let's save and reload that. So you can see we have some title here, and I'm gonna say I'm going to change the title, and only this one changes, but not this one that has v dash once. And the reason why that we want to use the v dash once in some places is that once we mark something as being only able to be used once, that means that it will not change again. And what Vue does underneath the hood is that it removes the reactivity portion for that specific data property to lower the overall overhead of that Vue application. So that leads to faster overall runtime performance, or if you just don't want something to change, right? So the main reason we wanna use it is we never want this thing to change once it's been rendered and it helps us save a little bit of performance by using v dash once when we do something like that, okay? So we've looked at a couple of directives here. Now, how do we go and actually uh, capture events so that it does something? Okay, let's go and uh, let's create a quick button somewhere. So um, how about we say, uh, okay. So let's go here and let's just create a input type, input type of uh, type equals maybe submit, right? Some kind of submit button and then value equals submit. Okay, oops, we got my thing on the wrong side. Let's reload this. There's our submit button, doesn't do anything. And then let's create a handler for this and we will say v dash on colon click equals submit clicked. All right, so now let's go and actually try to do something with this uh, in some way. So let's go and go into here and method colon. Submit click function alert 
Let's see if this works. I haven't done this in a while, but we'll find out if it works. Okay, so let's reload that. We hit submit, and you can see that we get a little pop-up that says, hello. So what have we done here? Let's examine this a little bit closely. We said V dash on click. So when we get a click on a click event, invoke the submit click. And as you see, we added a new fragment here inside of our view app declaration called methods, and we created a new function called submit click, which maps to this thing right here. And we simply go and uh, issued an alert. So if I click this again, you'll see that what that does. But we can also go and change the data, right? So we have this data for talk title, right? Which is this thing right here. And let's get rid of this for now. All right, let's simplify our application. Okay, so we have talk title. Let's see if we can go and manipulate this talk title directly. So we'll say this dot talk title equals you clicked the button. Let's see if this works. Let's reload this. And then when we click the submit button, you can see that we access the talk title. And then we go and change the value of that to say you click the button, right? Relatively straightforward. So get back to our outline real quick. So we captured some events with B dash click. And we can also talk a little bit more about expressions, which we tried to do. Let's see if we can fix um, what we did wrong with the property here. Okay, so let's go here. And uh, let's just say the time of day is just 12. Okay, instead of trying to return a function here. <laughs> okay, so let's add in our v dash if we'll say h1 v dash if equals, and we call this thing time of day, time of day is greater than 12 time of day time of time of day is greater than 12. you have to excuse my uh bad typing here okay so we didn't get it there now if we go and say this time of day is try 10 right there we go now we got it to work okay so what we did is uh, I had a function here previously that does work, but I did something a little bit wrong, but you can see how I fix this. I just said time of day is integer 12. And then I say V dash if, if time of day is greater than 10, then go and show this thing. And of course, if I change this to 15, I save and I hit reload, you'll see that that thing is gone now. Okay, so there's our V dash if. And what we did here is we used an expression inside of our view template. Okay, so a couple of different things that we haven't really covered in much detail in the overall structure of a view application or a view component is what we have here inside the HTML is our view template. And inside of here is our view application with the sections for data and methods and other things like that. All right, so we've covered some of the uh, basic stuff here. And what we can do is uh, have a look at some at something a little bit more elaborate. Let's just double check our outline to see if we've covered everything, which we have very quickly, of course, since this is a short session. Uh, let's see how we do a network call now. So I'm gonna switch to a separate project and look at this view application. And this one is a more real world view application. This has, as you can see, has a, a bunch of different folders. It's got a components folder, data, layouts, middleware, et cetera, pages. This is a Nuxt.js application. And Nuxt, again, is a framework that sits underneath view, or I should say on top of view, that allows you to build out a more comprehensive website and gives you lots of little tools to help you build out an app. And the specific component that I'm looking at is show article here. And you can see I have a V dash if, and I have this separate article thing here, which is a standard HTML tag. And I say, if this thing is not loading, then basically don't, uh, don't show the content, okay? So right here, I have loading set to true. So that means this won't be shown initially. And then my VHTML is this content. Now, what I want to do is I want to make a network call and go and inject some content into here. Let's go and pull this up, actually, so you can see what's going on. This is a little website I've been working on for a little while called the Java Cafe, uh, written in Vue.js. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to reload this page. And if you watch right here where my mouse is, 
you'll see that for a split second, it will say loading article, please wait. And then it will get filled in. Okay, so let's reload that. And you'll see it says loading article, please wait. And then boom, our content shows up. So where is that content coming from? Let's look at the network call that we're making here to make this happen, all right? So first thing I want to talk about quickly here is that I'm using a few of the view lifecycle hooks. I'm not using created and I'm not using updated. I just have those in for demonstration purposes. I'm specifically using the mounted lifecycle hook, which says when this view component, and again, I'm not, not a single page view application or not a single component view app anymore like we were seeing before. This is a multiple component with pages and other things like that. So I'm using components in here. And this is a single view component called show article. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm going to call this thing, which is the ASCII doc to HTML converter. And I'm using the Axios library in here, okay? So you can see if we look at this specific part right here, and again, you can see we're using an async await. So this mounted lifecycle hook, I have tagged with async and it will await for this Axios call to execute and return. Axios is a library that you use to inside of JavaScript to go and make network calls. And I say Axios, do a get call against this specific URL or the specific variable. That variable is essentially this cloud function right here that I have written, which is a simple ASCII doc to HTML converter. Okay, so it's got an ADOC source URL at the end of it. So basically you pass in some raw ASCII doc and it converts it to HTML. Let's have a quick look at that again. All right, so this is our ASCII doc right here. All right, so if I go and reload this again, you'll see it'll say loading article. And then when it has gone and done the conversion using that serverless cloud function, it goes and executes. And I have the example of this cloud function right here. So again, this is a, a simple serverless cloud function run, running on IBM cloud functions, which is based on Apache OpenWhisk. And if we go look at the source code for that cloud function, it's not, uh, not too terribly exciting. I use the ASCII doctor JS library, and then I use the request and request promise lib, and I essentially call right here in the middle. I say go and get the ASCII doc library, go and fetch the contents once you have them, and then return the body as that converted HTML. So what I've done is I've essentially used a cloud function to go and do this conversion from ASCII doc into HTML and then injected it into my view application directly inside of this component. Okay. All right. So let's make sure that we've covered everything real quick. And so we talked about going and running uh, using Axios. I'll show that again in just a second. How we hooked into a lifecycle event to do an update after we fetch some data and calling a serverless backend. We showed that very quickly. So again, Let's go and look at our view application. Okay, here's my template. I say, if it's not loading, don't show anything. When loading flips to, tr to false, this will become true and we will show the v-html, which is in the content. You can see I have my content variable and my loading variable both set here. I use the view lifecycle hook for mounted. So when the component gets mounted, this, the stuff that's in here will get fired. And I say, go and use Axios, make a HTTP get call to this IBM cloud function, which has an ASCII doc source URL. The cloud function, which I briefly showed, goes and grabs it, converts it to HTML and returns it into this application. Then we set loading equal to false. That triggers this v-if to show this thing. And of course, we set the content as the raw HTML from that return source. Okay, so um, we have a couple of minutes left and I want to stop here and take any questions to make sure that I have at least given you uh, a chance to ask some questions, okay? All right, so first of all, happy birthday. Oh, thanks, Matt. <laughs> um, Great to be 29 again. <laughs> right, 
there's a, there's a couple questions. One is, uh, let's the issue you couldn't figure out. One of the people in Slack actually figured it out for you. So the time of day call, right? When you were trying uh -huh. to get that from data, if you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you added parentheses on the end of it in the uh, expression, then it works. Right. So, so what you're saying is, if I did um, basically that. At no, the no, end, on right? the expression. So leave that like it is. Take off the parentheses there. Ah, oh, right, 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 right. I got you. Yep, yep. yep. You're right. You're right. Do it right. Yeah, there. I like that. Okay. Yep. That's right. So, so, so let, let me talk about that for just a second. The reason why I model this initially as a function is because when you write this as components, sometimes what you want to do is you want to get an instance of that data so that it's not static, right? So then it becomes basically unique to that component. But anyways, uh, we can move on to the next question. Okay, so the next question is, does the view lifecycle event tied to a specific component of view like in React? If so, how are components registered with view? Okay. So, so that's a great question. Um, let's go back to that uh, more complete example here. And so, so a view component, uh, when you create a view component instance, you get a true instance. And these lifecycle hooks here are in, in, encased inside of that specific instance. So these are, so every time you create a view component, it has its own unique created, mounted, updated, et cetera, hooks inside of it. So the components are independent. But if we go and look to see where this show article, and I'm just gonna do this because I want to make it a little bit clear uh, how that gets shown is like so, right? So you can see I have a V card component and then that show article that we were just looking at is a component that gets created, an instance of it gets created here. You can see this is why I pass in the article source, and then I import show article like so to use that component, and then um, I basically list out those components inside of the parent component, uh, in this case, the just the article um, page, uh, which is modeled as a component also. Right? So here's my article page component, which uses the show article subcomponent like so. Okay, I think I answered the question, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yep, and we're over time, but we have a coffee break for 15 minutes, so I'm just gonna ask you okay. a couple more and maybe we'll stop in like four minutes. So uh, what is sure. the difference between the data and the methods properties of a view object? Right, so that's a, that's a great question too. Let's flip back to our uh, sample app here, All right? So, so methods are, where we put, uh, I'm going to state the obvious here first and then answer it in more detail. <laughs> uh, the methods are where we put things that we want to execute inside of our view component, right? So that's like, for example, submit click. Data is a special container for where we put the properties for our components, right? Essentially, that's where we have the schema at build time for our component. I actually have a nice slide on this. So let me go find that real quick. So uh, as I'm talking over this, it will become a little bit more apparent what I'm trying to get at, if I can find it. Um, maybe not, there we go. All right, so we, we were talking about forms and models. Um, so, so the data essentially is how we go and model the schema for our, uh, for our application at dev time and then at runtime, the data becomes our model. So the, the difference is that the methods only contain things which we would refer to as things which are actions or functions that do things. And our data is locked into place when the component becomes instantiated. So for example, what that means is at runtime, I can't do something like this. I can't, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use this as an you know, this is probably not the right place to put it, but I'm just gonna use this method here to show you what I mean, okay? So you can see I did this dot talk title and that's our data, right? If, if we were able to get access into the, um, the, the overall data object, which you can't do it like this. Again, this is just like pseudocode for explanation purposes. I can't go and say, add new data property like so. This is not allowed to do something like this. So the data fragment or the data portion of your view component gets locked when that component is instantiated and you cannot dynamically add or remove 
anything from the data. You can change data components in here, as we saw. Like you saw that we changed the talk title here, and then you know we changed the, the greeting and things like that. But the data basically, uh, as I showed in this slide, is the schema, and at runtime becomes the model and can't change. And, and that's not where you have the actions. You put your actions into the methods. So, OK. Cool. So there are a couple of other questions, but I want to give people a time to take a break. So if you want to answer those okay. in Slack under the track-javascript channel, then. Yep, I'm in there. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Yep. Thanks, y'all.